I am joined by an expert in macro and banking, Patrick Parrott Green, founder of PPG Macro. Patrick, you've been a uh, you know veteran of trading rates in Asia, uh, tr- uh, working in bank treasury departments. Uh, started working on your own, uh, you know, over the past uh, you know close to a decade. Great to have you here. Welcome to Forward Guidance. It's great to be with you. Thanks, Jack. Patrick, I want to start by just showing the audience something that y- was on your radar uh, very early uh, in the fall of 2022, last year. You wrote liquidity warning, small U.S. banks uh, for commercial real estate loans and non-bank liquidity, basically showing that base liquidity at smaller U.S. banks had plunged and you had sent these to your your clients at at PPG Macro. And as people can see, circled in red is you sent this on October 5th. And about, uh, let's say, you know, five or six months later, we started having all this banking turmoil. So needless to say, this email has aged quite well. What was it that you had seen, you know, in the summer and fall of 2022 that was uh, getting on your radar, getting you a little bit worried? And then, yeah, what have you made of the recent fallout? I'm a sort of a bit of a, a geek when it comes to the, the sort of monetary data. So every week, religiously, I'll go through the H4 report and the H8 report. The H4, obviously, being the Fed's balance sheet report that comes out every Thursday, oh, late on Thursdays, and the H8, which is about the commercial banks. And their assets and liabilities and obviously banks balance sheets are both on assets and liabilities because of everything to do with the pandemic and in the us particularly because of fis- fiscal largesse um saw these dramatic changes excess liquidity yada 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 very high balances on cash um and deposits but deposits have been falling consistently reserves have been falling consistently since the beginning of last year and it was basically you get to the point where you just go like loan deposit ratios for big banks were very have generally trended downwards pretty consistently but small banks um started to pick up their their lending picked up very quickly and as we now know when we talk about signature and svb and first um, first republic or worst republic um and actually i would just one little sideline on that it, i would say uh the worst republic is definitely california or the san francisco banking district because so many of those problems seem to be centered there and the funny thing is they doesn't look like they've got they've gone they've, they've improved over the past 16 years when again so many of the problems were in the San Francisco banking district. So, so there was just little warning signs that their liquidity ratios were dropping. And we've already started, we were already very clear that commercial real estate was already starting to, to suffer. And ever since then, we've seen far more stories, far more sources of woe. Um, you've got big private equity names. And, you know, I'm not going to talk about the, I mean, you know, I could talk about the Black Death Star as um that's how i call it you know blackstone um <laughs> but it's more um when you've got the likes of pimco and brookfield handing back the keys on commercial buildings and just walking away um you know all is not well with the world and then you have to say question okay b- banks um are supposedly well regulated and supervised. Well, we've just had the Fed do a mea culpa about that. And we've got a situation where smaller banks, and it's very arbitrary the way the Fed describes it. It's basically anything bar the largest 25 by asset basis. Well, I haven't seen the latest ranking because obviously three of those banks or two banks that are in the top 25 have disappeared, SVB and FRC, and Signature were number 29. Um, so there's, there's a shuffling up, but it's basically, it's quite a crude definition, but small, small, re, small U S banks, um, are disproportionately exposed to commercial real estate. So while, um, they only have something like 30% of the banking assets, they have 70% of the CRE loans. So they're basically stuck with a liquid product. Um, how much of that lending is floating and how much of that is fixed is, is hard to say. How much of it's hedged? I mean, I can't remember which Fed it was recently put a paper out about the lack of interest rate hedging 
amongst banks as well. If I'm Citibank or a big bank, basically the top four, uh, the losses on my available for sale portfolio is directly is a direct hit to my capital. Smaller banks, it's not. Hold to maturity isn't, so it's just there as a great big blob. But even at the end of, uh, I think at the end of the fourth quarter, the FDIC said that the unrealized losses of both portfolios of the U.S. banks was was well over six hundred billion dollars. So roughly about a quarter of the cap of the actual capital of the U.S. banking system. So there's lots of little flags out there, and as liquidity was draining. Um, big banks were continuing to do well, um, very high levels of deposits. Yes, they were coming down, but the loan deposit ratios uh, were fine. They also are generally well managed, or vastly better managed than they used to be. Um, and um, so I, for example, was working at Citibank in 2007, and we used to joke that the, the term chief risk officer was an oxymoron. So um, they've improved enormously. The problem is small banks have grown rapidly. It's very clear from the Fed's post-mortem that they, while their assets um, exploded, uh, their oversight didn't accordingly. So you double the size of your balance sheet, but did you actually add any more to your risk team? Well, we, yeah. well in fact, in SVB, they didn't even have a chief risk officer. So, you know, I mean, we're talking about... So one is that that sort of yes we've expanding because everything hey everything's great everything it's a buy everything rates are low we're making loads of money look at our nim but all of a sudden actually you know those those big mortgages that first republic gave fixed at three percent or wherever they gave them to multi to the billionaires or multi-millionaires and all of a sudden well oh we're going to have to we're borrowing a discount window at five so you know, and then we end up on the road to bankruptcy. Uh, and, and and the problem is, um, even allowing for deposit insurance, and the great majority of deposits in the US um, and for SMEs, they don't even challenge the 250,000 limit. So introducing, extending insurance is really just another sop to the elite. If you've got more than $250,000 in your bank account, you should be financially aware enough to understand the risks. I think that's a reasonable approach to take. But the problem is, there is that fear of contagion. I mean, it's just things were getting dicey. And then as, things, as more and more data came out, so then you can see actually that technically, even at the end of 2022, uh, First Republic was already. Um, in deficit, when you added up its valuations of its on on its on, on its losses on its loan book and everything else, and its rates as well. So one of the things I noticed when I was looking through First Republic's results, because they put the rates of their investments, mm -hmm. is actually it turns out during 2022, they were actually selling bonds that were in the money, and and so the average rate yield they were getting actually fell. It was it was lower for Q Q one twenty three than it was in Q Q two twenty two. Mm. So they're basically mean to keep the keep the hamster on the wheel. They'd actually been oh wherever we can realize a profit, let's realize a profit. Oh to, oh to hell with the ones that are in in loss. We'll just ignore those. Classic. It's like the classic bad gambler. Yeah, yeah. So Patrick, just to explain a few things. So you said fixed versus floating. That's fixed rates. You're, you're when you have a loan, you get four percent every single time versus variable rate, floating rate. Oh, if interest rates go up to five percent, now you're getting five percent. That's key on the asset side because, as we now know, on the liability side, what banks are paying is changing rapidly as the Federal Reserve raises interest rates from zero to five percent. Uh, you also said available for sale AFS versus held to maturity uh, HTM, and then NIM is their net interest margin, the spread between what they get on their loans 
and what they uh, have to pay uh, uh, depositors and and you know their, on their on their liabilities. I, I, so when you talked about First Republic, the problem was a a NIM problem. They just did, were not earning enough on their assets. They made you know mortgages to very wealthy people at two and a half percent, three percent, and so now they have to you know back, back when they existed, unfortunately, they you know they had to borrow from the uh, federal home loan bank at five percent. So they have a you just know, think about you know the the value of that loan is just like it's just like the value of a price of a, of a bond. Right. So if rates go up, the price goes down. So you know you've got it's not just a NIM problem, but you've actually got a mark to market problem. If you're a liquidation point, then you're just going to really a huge loss and be bankrupt. Silicon Valley Bank, they had that problem in mortgage-backed securities. They bought all this paper that yielded a low rate, and so the, the value went down. You wrote today, you know, something smells in, in the banking system. I mean, how do, you, how do you think this plays out, and to what degree do you think this crisis seems over? Because you can make a case, oh, you know, First Republic fell, but that, that was the, the last bank t- to fall, and, you know, credit quality so far seems good. Yeah, what do you what do you what do you mean? What do you, how would you respond well, to that case? Well, I, well, for a start, all these things have happened uh, when the economy hasn't been in recession. So there's another element as well. So we so far we've just talked about the prices of fluctuations in the value of securities, NIM, all that sort of stuff. But what we haven't even touched on is the coming hit in delinquencies as well. So that's the other side of it. When the bankrupt, and we're already seeing things like credit cards that, um, particularly amongst younger demographics, it's the delinquency rates are, are already surging, while they're getting away with so far thirty-eight months of forbearance on um, student loans. Surging so from student- very low levels, though, right? It's like if if delinquency rate is ten basis points and it goes to twenty basis points, the delinquency rate has doubled, but it's still not high. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, some of the stuff now, and you know, I was seeing on Twitter today, when I mean, you were back to sort of 2019 levels of delinquency on subprime, we're back on subprime credit cards. Uh, we're back, we're actually at higher levels of delinquency than we were in 2019. So we've got these other kickers, you know, people, income growth is slowing. <laughs> Excess savings have largely disappeared. San Fran Fed did an economic letter on, on Monday highlighting that um, excess savings were down to 500 billion. The problem is those excess savings are really just left with the rich. So they're not, you know, they're not going to consume those so much. And actually, if you just deflated it as well, the number's even less. So if you think about it, excess savings were 2 trillion and we're down to 500. So they've effectively, because they have this huge boost largely from Uncle Sam, um, that um, that's roughly six percent of GDP. So no wonder consumption has remained reasonably strong. But now that that process is clearly coming to an end. So as growth starts to to slip, and a lot of our high frequency measures, I you know I'm a big fan of of freight data because it's live. And I was just reading something today um, from the guys at FreightWaves.com, yeah. who They're I great. think are a go-to source of data. Um, that rates have just actually, you know, they were expecting that, hoping that we were going to get a spring lift off as we normally do. And rates have actually just cracked to new lows again. And they do these things like the rejection rates, so, i.e. how many truck, how many truckers are t- turning down contracts and are hitting new lows as well. So we know freight is exceptionally weak. We know that inventories are extraordinarily high. So, for example, the, the inventory sales ratio for merchant wholesalers is was only, you know, let's exclude pandemic skewed data where you get these ludicrous spikes in activity, et cetera, was only higher in 2008. So we've got a, a massive excess of inventory, which will have to be worked down. Um, but again, it, it just, um, when you look at those sort of ratios against inflation, they say, it points to much lower inflation. If you look at the, glo- the New York Fed's global supply um, index, um, that came out um, that's out this week. It's at a new low. Um, and funnily enough, it's got a great correlation with Chinese PPI, which also came out today, which fell to minus, it's down 3.6% year on year. And China is the world's producer. So that's another side of things. So, so let's just say we do go into recession. But then the delinquencies start to 
to really kick in. And then, and the, the problem is then nobody has any money. Jamie Dimon may have got a, a deal on First Republic, but don't don't think that you're going to get lots of other banks running to buy up assets of of banks that run into difficulty. So when you see the story in the FT today about Blackstone um, offering to act as an intermediary between banks and insurers to try and shift loans, sell insur loans onto insurers. Insurers are just gonna go, well, hang on. One, I don't really wanna buy those loans. So yes, long-term, there's talk of us getting more stuff in private credit, but if I think we're on a recession and lending tightens are particularly tightened, and we know delinquencies are gonna to, going to be, be rising, then why on earth would I wanna buy a loan unless it's very attractive? And two, if the bank wants to make it attractive enough to sell, he's going to have to take a big capital hit on the value of the loan in the first place. So it's it's sort of like, and that's and getting Blackstone involved is like saying to someone earlier on today is like putting the fox in the in the hen house. Um, when you look at their own problems with their REITs and lots of their commercial properties, um, so that's right, Patrick, So I want to ask: people talk about the Blackstone B REIT Real Estate um, Investment Trust, where uh, people who want to withdraw their money, there's a gate. Oh, you can only withdraw X amount of X billion dollars uh, per month. That sounds yeah. bad and it is bad for the investors, but for systemic st stability, it actually can be good because people can't call their money all at once, right? Unlike a bank where people can, and you have a disaster as, we, as we've seen you know, three times just, just over the past few months. So, I mean, I know it sounds a very cynical argument, but the investors are, you know, they, they've they've been tied to the mast, so to speak, and so they can they can only withdraw so much. So Blackstone won't be forced to sell. Yeah, that's all right. That's all well and good. So what do they do if they need cash? They go and sell stuff they don't really want to sell, or they reduce their activity and they preserve their capital, which in turn reduces overall economic activity, which then makes the recession worse, and all their assets fall in value. Yeah. So I mean, it, you know. You don't get any great, you know, when it comes to this sort of environment, ultimately it's every man for himself. Um, the collective, you know, there's no kumbaya spirit around. So I want to ask you this. Will more banks fail in the U.S.? How many are the regional banks? What do you think is going to happen? Be, be right, I think, yes, we will see some. Um, but, you know, their asset size is low. I mean, the big, the big banks are solid. My real concern is not, um, is not so much the banks. I mean, they, there is a, they are vitally important for a huge chunk of the US economy. So you think about, you know, SMEs or the way that the large companies, so generally the definition is, is 500 employees or less or a turnover of sort of less than of 25 million or less. Those company, you know, companies which don't have access to financial, to the investment banking world, they they just live with, you know, they're dependent on their, on their banks and, and it is their regional banks. So if the regional banks are feeling pressured, as we see, we see with the senior loan officers survey, well, you go along for a loan now, one, the bank's going to want more collateral or a higher level of, it's going to want more collateral or, or a, a lower loan to value mortgage, whatever, you know, low rating. Or a higher, also rate, going to check, higher loan yield. And, he's, and, and also one of the biggest, right, one, while people say, oh, there wasn't that much change in, change in the senior loan. Reality is if 55% if are saying, yes, we've got tighter conditions from the previous condition, it's still very strong. But on, what we saw particularly in the latest one was a very significant rise in the cost of credit to be charged. So then you get go along and you think you're a businessman and you go, okay, we want to expand, we're doing quite well. We haven't got, you know, we need to borrow some money, but then you go along to the bank and he goes, well, you know, I want the X, Y, and Z. And then you do your math and it, it just no longer makes sense from a business person. So you don't invest. And so that's so in turn, growth is reduced. So you, you know, it's just this, gradual circle that just carries on. Hey there, sorry to interrupt. Announcement. 
Blockworks is hosting an event called Permissionless in September. It's a crypto event. It's in Austin, Texas. We did Permissionless in 2022. It was the biggest and best DeFi event in the world. And this year, Lightning will be striking twice. Historically, our ticket prices have gone up about 10 times from the day the tickets go live to the day before the event. If you're like me and bad at math, that's 900%. So it might be savvy for attendees to consider buying tickets now rather than later. If you're listening to this and you're saying, Hey, Jack, I'm not really into this whole crypto thing. I want to hear about the Fed. I want to hear about the dollar, Bretton Woods, three, four, five. I hear you. I'm not telling you to buy a ticket and the interview will resume momentarily. However, if you are into the crypto thing and permissionless is something you might want to attend, what I'm saying is there's no time like the present because tickets will go up and if history is any guide, prices will go up a ton. Anyway, the link is in the description and you can get an additional 10% off by using code GUIDANCE10. Thanks. Let's get back to the interview. Yeah, so Patrick, I I took, you know, as someone who's not an expert at all, I just looked at the senior loan officer survey, compared the numbers to 2007, 2008, and it seems like it's in, you know, maybe late 2007, early spring, winter 2008 levels, not the 2008, 2009 levels. It's important to say it is a, I don't know if it's a diffusion index, but they're asking people about a relative state of change. So, you know, if there's a seven foot tall man, and then you say the next data set is a six foot 11 man. You say, oh, he's shorter. So the data says, oh my God, the data says he's so short. No, he's, he's six foot 11. Likewise, we had a record credit boom in 2022. People say we had monetary deflation in 2022. They are wrong. Look at the chart of loans and leases in 2022 off the charts. Yo, it, oh, uh, but yes. that's, that's one of the problems. You see, that's one of the real problems about that. So one of the reasons that bank lending actually grew uh, in 2022 was because of the collapse of issuance in markets. So if you look at high yield issuance, it's an absolute fraction of what it was in, and also a lot of the, you know, if you think about the low mortgage market, a collapse in origination. I mean, origination, I think in 2021, because of all the refi, et cetera, was, was roughly, I think something of the order, if you look at night black, I think it was of the order of like $4 trillion. Of, of and then of actual new originations was probably about one point six or two, but but then purchasing dies. So actually, overall credit creation slowed dramatically. But for the banks, one non banks were no longer able to compete, so people had to go to the banks. Two rates had gone up a lot, so so not only were rates higher, so they were able to make more of a profit the big margin there, but also they were able to widen their spreads because the competition from the the sort of the investment banking world, yes, the non-bank world, had largely dissipated. A- now, and they, they what they paid to, on deposits was still close to zero because rates were still zero yeah. on the short end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were still flush with liquidity. The problem is liquidity is uh, an ephem- ephemeral concept. Mm-hmm. You know, it's there until it's not. And, and, and just think about it. Um, you know, I often describe it is so people talk about reserves or narrow money versus broad money and all this sort of stuff. Um, the best way for it to look at it is it's like the oil in the engine of one's car. And the problem is, yeah, as some of these banks did, they kept on driving down the highway, doing 70 miles an hour or, or speeding a lot of them. Uh, and they forgot to check their oil levels. And so what happens, your engine blows up in the end. And that's, a, I think it's a pretty accurate metaphor for some of the banks out there. And um, and now, of course, they're scrabbling for liquidity. So they're going to the Fed or they're trying to raise funds and they're having to take, you know, which are expensive. And they're basically locking in losses or reduced income, which also are going to affect their earnings and their overall value. And they're just, and and as I said, we haven't even start to hit the de- the default cycle, the delinquency cycle. Bank lending, that chart that we can show up, exploded in 2022. You made the excellent point that that's because other forms of capital raising in the capital markets, issuing bonds, convertible notes, raising equity, that froze in 2022. But I would make the same point. In 2020 and 2021, you had a record bubble in high yield debt issuance, investment grade issuance, IPOs, SPACs. So the huge contraction in 2022 was from a ridiculously bubblicious high 
itself in the same way that the contraction credit now is from a bubbleicious level in 2022. Yeah, but what we're also seeing is an awful lot of that issuance. So we look at CLOs or the CMBSs that were done then, they're actually very short term. High yield debt is very short term. So already you're now you know seeing people with, with CMBSs and you're finding this, with, we're seeing that in commercial real estate, that they're coming to refi. And even not only those, the Renados of this world with their mm-hmm. rate locks. And so the big property managers, they took, they, you know, there's not just issuance, but they took out rate locks, but being greedy, they just go, oh, we'll just take a three-year one. And now they're having to the rate lock and they're, they're absolutely, they're, again, they're in difficulty as well. So you've got, so you've got a refinancing factor here. So, I, you know, there's some real problems starting to kick off in, in CLOs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was reading an article yesterday about how, for once, you know, people generally think that, oh, high yield is more risky than CLOs. Well, actually, what we're seeing is CLOs doing worse than actual high yield. So if you look at HYG, for example. Right. Um, so there's, and then there is this whole issue of the non-banks. And this is my, and I think people, you know, BIS, um, the Financial Stability Report writes about it. But what we have seen since 2008 it is, it is an explosion in the assets put into the private equity stroke shadow banking world with higher bitter models. And we've also got this big problem, and I think this is one of the things that um, I said to a now retired Fed president last October. Um, um, they said, well, if you think about it, if you were 30 in 2008, and let's say you hadn't bought a property yet, most, you know, and you're now 45, you've spent your mat- your entire mature adult life in a low rate environment. You've perpetually conditioned yourself to having to spend a relatively low percentage of one's income to service one's debt. And now we just had the biggest monetary tightening globally. Probably actually, it's even great. So we can talk about high rates in the early 80s and stuff like that. But rates were perpetually high. Uh, and so if rates went from 12 to 15, yes, it was painful. And I remember having a mortgage in the UK in 1989, and it was 15%. So, but it, a relative shift was minor. But here you've gone from, you know, rates were at zero. Actually, the shadow feds funds rate according to the San Fran Fed, was like minus 1%. And now the shadow Fed's funds rate is closer to 7 And the shadow Fed, that take, what does that take into account? Just things that... Well, you know, it, it's more a question, of, yeah, it's a sort of, well, it takes more allowance of spreads as well. So actually, if okay. you look at the shadow Fed's funds rate and overlay it versus the mortgage rate, it actually has a better fit. And we look at, if you look at the spread of, of between... The 30 year mortgage rate, or the average 30 year mortgage rate, and the long bond now, it's wider than it was at the peak of the GFC. You know, 30 yeah. year mortgage rates, what, 660, 670, and we've got a long bond at um, 373. So 300 basis points differential. And that probably has maybe something to do with quantitative tightening because the spread between MBS, mortgage backed security spreads over treasuries. That's, effect, that's affected by quantitative easing, but no. A little bit, but actually Ish. because of the lack of activity and origination and refi, we're not getting actually much roll off. And actually the bigger factor that actually makes our MBS, actually I personally uh, have been talking to clients for a long time, um, really for the part, you know, the, since November, and then we had a big rally in it. But over now, if I was a fixed income portfolio manager, I'd be buying our MBS because I'm not too worried about, you know, the AAA agency. Or not worried about rates going higher, yeah. Um, but, and also, but origination has collapsed. So the collapse in, indura- in origination in MBS has had a far more bigger a- a- impact than the actual, any roll off by the Fed's balance sheet. Right. It's it Patrick, should be positive. The future. So it's CLO, you said earlier, that's collateralized loan obligation, CMBS, commercial mortgage backed security. VNO is a Vornado real estate investment trust. The VNO is the ticker. The stock has fallen uh, quite quite sharply. BIS Bank for International Settlements, a central bank for central banks. Although you know, they I, I talked to someone who used to work at the BIS, and he said central bank for central bank sounds important, but really all we did is write papers and have meetings. But, uh, but they do do great. They do do great papers, and this is yeah. another issue. They I do would do great talk papers. About. 
yeah. I, I want to talk about. So we talk about the problems of overall liquidity, but there's a global impact as well. So basically, there's this big argument. Oh, look at the size of US money supply relative to from where it was. But actually, if you look at it against nominal GDP, it's now back to trend. So we've had this ever rising trend of increased money supply with nominal GDP and the percentage has got higher. So it's every year we need more debt money to support, to create a, a unit of nominal GDP growth. So it's back to trend now, but it actually is. There's this argument about, you know, is it about the size or is it about the flow? And I'm much more of a flow man. So we now have US money supply, nominal money supply falling properly for the first time since before World War II. Yeah. And the last time that happened was 1937, and then you ended up with a very nasty recession. So US money supply has fallen for the first time since before the World War II. Look at it from the perspective of all the economic research is done, all by central banks. I mean, I, you know, I, I look at central banks and, you, you know, they're all – doesn't matter if you work for the ECB or the Bank of England or the Fed, they're all the same. They've all got their masters in economics, gone and done their PhD. Most of them don't know how to change a change a plug or a tire. Uh, you know, and um the, there's a sort of generic gene pool of them. And, and and going back to this Fed president, I said, Well, you know, I only want to worry about what about money supply? And he literally rolled his eyes at me as if it was like, oh, no, we don't talk about money supply anymore. No matter that the greatest Federal Reserve chairman in history, in history Paul Volcker, uh, was a massive believer in it. It was like, oh, no, forget Volcker. He didn't know what he's talking about. Right. Okay, fine. Yeah, what have you done? Um, and um, so but I don't think – I mean, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I, I struggle. I look around and I – Try, try and find a Fed paper that talks about falling money supply and the potential consequences of it. There isn't any because partly because they don't never consider it would happen, and secondly, uh, they've sort of dismissed dismiss monetary economics. Um, so this is another problem, another concern I have is that you know, central banks don't have a playbook for this. Unless they go back to, oh, yes, let's print more money, but the political appetite for that is negligible. So we're in a, this is why I had a sort of constant theme that we're into the unknown here. And it's not just US money supply, it's UK money supply, it's European money supply. M1 in, in Europe is down 4% year on year. So obviously we only have 20 odd years history of, of Eurozone data, but it certainly doesn't smell right. Yes, it does. It Pat Patrick, could you ex explain in a your relatively simple way, as simply as you can, why the money supply is falling? It sounds. It sounds. You know, the last time it happened was during the the Great Depression. But it's you know now banks. It's not that banks are cutting off loan making loans entirely. They're just you know, slowing loan growth. Does it does it have to do with quantitative tightening at all? Like why? Oh, absolutely. Oh, no, yeah, that's much, a big factor yeah. because you're just the money is just disappearing. You know, Fed issued reserves on the back. On, on, when it bought bonds, we're, we're cancelling bonds. I mean, what we're seeing, if you look at Europe, is actually the, the ECB has reduced its balance sheet by a much greater stage than, than, the, than the Fed has. The ECB's, in a matter of months, basically locked 1.1 1, 1. 1 trillion euros. Right, but Patrick, that's, uh, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, high-powered central bank money. When you talk about money supply contracting, I think you're talking about a form of bank deposits, which are the liabilities of commercial banks, not the liabilities of the Fed. Well, it's, all, it's all, it all has an effect because you get excess reserves sitting on banks' balance sheets so that they have, you know, so that's on one side of the balance sheet. So you've got to have a, so, an offsetting. So that's a, a liability. So you need an offsetting asset. And as those liabilities fall, you reduce your assets. So we're, that's one of the ways it, it just basically functions. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's, there's, there are other measures. So, for example, um, Lacey Hunt is a big fan, fan of other uh, ODL, other yep. depository liabilities. Uh, ODL is collapsing at an unprecedented rate. It's absolutely collapsing. So if, if those liabilities are collapsing on one side of the balance sheet, it's much harder for me to increase my assets. So I'm going to reduce the amount of lending I do. I'm going to 
just be more cautious. And, and this is the, some of the problems that we've seen. So when we look at the loan deposit ratios, the loan deposit ratios of small banks have absolutely leapt because deposits have gone down. Mm-hmm. Loans haven't really fallen yet. But we people will talk about, oh, but loans are still growing. Well, that's a lagged effect because you think about it, you take a loan, you apply for a loan. You don't, you don't necessarily draw down on that instantaneously. I think we're only going to really see the, the effects on lending in the next over the next three months, we'll start to see that effect come through. But overall, um, and then we look at foreign banks in the US, and their loan deposit ratio is now at a record high. So that's another, is that another area? Because foreign banks- Wait, so sorry, Patrick, explain explain what's going on. You, you So you've been tracking the foreign banks within the US and what they've been doing in terms of their liabilities, their assets is very strange. Explain in a very simple way what you've been noticing and why it's significant. One of the issues is that the foreign banks of their $1.2 trillion of deposits, 60 odd percent, something like 760 billion of them are what the Fed classifies as um, they're basically uh, yeah um, other assets i got term, you yeah they're term deposits large term deposits which are all well, their, their definition is over a hundred thousand dollars so basically they're going to be more than a hundred thousand dollars so those are largely in, in, uninsured so if you're a corporate you know you're a corporate treasury you put you know you deal you have your international banking relationships but at the same time being a corporate treasurer and i've seen what's happened to credit suisse i've seen what's happened to smaller banks there's 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 no upside for me keeping in a bank what I need apart from my immediate budgetary needs, let's say a month's worth of expenditures. So just on a career risk policy, why not put my stuff in a in a government money market fund and protect my liquidity? So you could end up so we're keeping an eye on this one because initially the foreign banks didn't see any effect. So we had the problems in March with the domestic banks, but then foreign banks have only really started to see large deposit outflows in the past four or five weeks. If that continues, they may have to start going to the Fed or trying to raise liquidity elsewhere or try and get money from their parents. Or as we look, and if you got, you know, if we look at what happened with Credit Suisse, credit, we saw the expansion in swap lines. Well, of course, the Fed doesn't say it's the SMB, but we all knew it was the Swiss National Bank. Yep providing liquidity so keep an eye out will twi- will spot lines start to be tapped that's another sort of tension then you that would lead off to strain but has financial stability effects but it'll, but you'll see credit spreads come under pressure cross currency basis will come under pressure and generally that would actually strengthen the dollar and also we're at a time here where everyone's gone oh the fed's going to pivot first look at rates well that's all in the price we look at forward rates so the painful thing now would be for the dollar to actually go stronger as well. Well, basically, if you think foreign banks are short of dollars, they may have to go to their parents, to go to central banks, to utilize swap lines, to then lend them dollars. But they're also going to curtail their activities. But that can lead to strains in FX markets and broader risk assets. And then we've got other issues as well, which may exacerbate a dollar rally as what's going on in China as well. So if you notice in the recent FX rally or or the dollar weakness, the one currency that hasn't really participated has been the the Chinese yuan. So if you look at Euro CNH, which is the main cross, that's right up at its highs. But that's also China's got deflation, certainly in producer prices, which is the only major price measure that counts the rest of the world because it is the provider of goods to the rest of the world, but also it's a massive competitor with the other major export country area, which is, of course, the Eurozone. Patrick, I just want to just clarify on the non-US banks act- active within the US on the liability side and the asset side. Okay, so on the liability side, they don't have a lot of retail depositors. They've issued wholesale uh, deposits, you know, CDs, certificates of, of deposits, as well as you know, uh, uh, deposits over a hundred thousand dollars. So that's on the liability yeah. side. So they're the most vulnerable. On the asset side, who are they making the loans to? You said there it's a lot of commercial loans. Uh, yeah, they'll be basically providing financing to to, to corporates. Um, it's not. It's it's as I said. It's, it's if you look at their balance, 50, 50, almost half of their loan work is is CNI. However, 
More recently, they've also, over the past year or two, two years, they've increased lending to what's called classified as other, other um, not depo non, non depository financial institutions. So that could be a hedge fund, it could be a private equity firm. It will take it, it, it takes money. Probably often money, much of that is actually um, used for leverage. And then there's another area which is basically other unclassified lending, which is also sword. So we don't, you know, it's not, we know it's not CNI and we know it's not towards residential or, 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 or commercial real estate. It's just a great blob. Got it. Okay. So Patrick, thanks. Now let's move on to, you called the European Central Bank hike of 2008 a economic war crime. And you said that the ongoing rate hikes from the Federal Reserve or the ECB were the same thing. Why are they an economic war crime to hike interest rates during a bank recession, during a bank, bank turmoil? Well, one, the, the flow of credit is already diminishing. Two, um, Central bankers are always telling us that the lags of monetary policy are long. So if you get a bad one bad inflation month's inflation data, given it's been everything's now turning south, um, that's going to you know it has no 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 effect whatsoever. It's just a mean it's it's like a meaningless gesture. Oh yes, look at us, we're being credible, but we've already put so much tightening in the system both in in rates and in terms of QT and and tighter credit conditions that sometimes you know it's like baking a cake some you, you know you don't turn the oven up to speed the cooking of the cake otherwise you'll burn it or Toreo used it uh, Milton Friedman's phrase about you know the shower's not warm enough because you're waiting for the water to come through and you end up scalding yourself because you increase you know and it's very much that so we are at a time for patience, and I would actually argue that um, you know, sticky inflation, some of these things have made them possibly over tighten. Whereas um, they surely should have just been clearer in their messaging, which has always been a problem. Um, but actually saying, well, you know, we've done a hell of a lot, and it's time to just. And I think we are at that point now, um, but. I mean, in 2008, we could see what was going on in the world. We'd already had loads of bankruptcies and banks failing. Um, got worse, obviously, when Lehman went down and then the UK banking system went down as a whole. But, um, you know, you had this knee-jerk reaction from the ECB because the oil price was at $140 in the middle of 08. So headline inflation was out there. It doesn't matter that money growth had been declining significantly for well over a year the m1 in europe was down to zero percent and the monetary conditions were already very tight so it was just like a, 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 it was like a, a futile oh world war one let's go over the top trench when you've got trench no warfare. chance of getting across no man's land it's a pretty grim analogy is it are we is that a, a grim analogy apply here as well I think, well, put it this way, if the Fed hadn't done what it's done, um, we would not have been seeing the, the pain that we've seen in banks. The problem is we, we, we've obviously seen a huge amount of change post-pandemic um, with, you know, there's there's been a shift in the efficiency of the office spaces also, there's, there's but broader, there's been big trends behind that. I, pre-pandemic people were still wanting to move to more green energy efficient buildings so you, you know you just go to manhattan and you see these big old 50s 60s 30 blocks that they just can't do anything with they actually probably some of them actually haven't have because you can't convert them to residential on a cost-effective basis they actually have a negative you actually give once you actually set the, sort of add in the demolition costs they'll probably have a negative value so they just sit there vacant. I think there's a big one on sort of Broadway at the top of it. It's near Central Park. And it's just, they can't give it away. So that comes to all these other loan books. So people say, oh yes, US banks, their loan books are solid. 
uh, well managed, you know. But some of the stuff, the, the shift in valuations we've seen are enormous. So there's the class the Union Bank, their headquarters in San Fran, twenty nine. Just bought by but, US Bank, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I have my own concerns about US Bank. Um, and even the other ones, I mean, so why is it, so City, I, was just, I think I saw it on Twitter today, City are paying like 0 0.1 on an instant deposit account, on instant access account, and PNC is paying four and three quarters. So why is the sixth largest bank in the US having to pay four and three quarters? Um, and, um, but that's, that's another story. But the Union Bank building, so they own it. It was well maintained, you could depreciate it. Was valued at 300 billion, I think, and it's just sold for like around 65. Sorry, 300 million. It's just sold for 65. And that is not a distressed seller. That's not a bank in possession. When banks, and this is the other thing, banks, in, when banks start receiving stuff, they are not, from a regulatory perspective, they're not allowed to become long term landlords. So they have to get this stuff off their balance sheet. So they just they provisioned on loans. They may lose some more money, but basically they they, they just so put they it would be a auction. distressed seller. Whereas this bank, uh, Union Bank, owned the building, which was just bought by U.S. Bank. What are your concerns on U.S. Bank? I've you know Warren Buffett has owned it. Bank analysts I've talked to think very highly of it, uh, at least historically. Per, perhaps not now. Yeah, you mean the same bank analysts who all Go had ahead. FRC and SVB on, on their buy recommendation lists until they didn't. Yeah. Okay, but Warren Buffett didn't own First Republic. I mean, the, the return on equity of U.S. Bank is a reason. I mean, it trades at a, it used to trade at a higher book to uh, price to book value than J.P. Morgan. Still looks, it still looks expensive to. I mean, I don't really do stocks, and I try and avoid. But basically, a common feature amongst all the banks that have gone bust is how rapidly their equity capital relative to their assets has declined over the past two years. And you, so that is and, almost and, entirely because of interest rate risk, not credit risk, correct? Well, no, because they one, they expanded their assets. And well, not boosting, bolstering their equity. What what bank has failed because their loan book went bad? I would say none so far. I'm not saying it won't happen, but correct? Yeah, they just ran out of they ran out of liquidity. They ran out of, you know, their model, you know, borrow short, lend long. But but also, there is this element about well, how much capital is in the bank? So how much how much reserve do they have? What how trust you know how solid are they? And um, a common feature amongst all the banks that have gone bust has been the, the and it and it's the, the fact is it's the it's the rapid decline in those ratios over the past three years. So you can look, I've, I've tweeted them about them in the past, put them up, and you can look at the ones, a lot of the ones that are under pressure now, so PacWest, Comerica, or wherever, whatever, have very low, low equity to capital ratios. They're sort of around about 6%. So um, do they actually, if you take their losses and all the other stuff, do, do they actually have any capital left? And then you go well. If they, if they, if the net position is their capital less, then they shouldn't be running it as a bank. Otherwise, they go and raise capital and improve, solidify their balance sheet, and take a hit on their returns. You know, I mean, there there are two ways you can run a bank treasury book. And if you're working in a, you know, obviously you want to maximize the income. At the same time, you always have to have an eye on prudence and your and your regulatory liquidity obligations, and and that comes obviously at the cost of reduced returns, certainly in that area. And unfortunately, my perception is that too too many banks have focused on using their treasury operations or the, as the banking operations as a profit center, and have failed to spend enough attention looking on the, as how a bank treasury operates as a liquidity center. Right. So you have the common equity to your ratio. They said it was 12. It turns out it's actually six because all of these risk, uh, you know, low risk assets such as agency mortgage backed securities. Well, no, it's just, because, well, part, most, large part of it is down because their asset base has expanded so much over the past few years. 
So you right, had right. and those asset bases that they bought are now worth less in the market. So they have, right? Yeah. Or, 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 oh, no, I, 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 see, I see what you're saying. Okay. It's yeah. just basically yeah. what, how, much, how, much, how much gas does a bank have, it, have, it have in its tank? Yeah. And, and the problem is, as we've seen, um, you know, another, in this digital age, which was the other thing that Powell fessed up to, was, oh, well, now that the fact that everyone's got a smartphone, which they didn't have in 2008, and most banks weren't, didn't, you couldn't bank online in 2008. Yeah, you'd have to drive now, to the this, bank, wait, it's a hassle. Why not just go take a nap instead of doing it? But now you can just do it from your, from your- uh, Yeah, you just go click and then, banks, then you, then you take a nap. Yeah, so Patrick, you're absolutely right that, yeah, banks swelled in size, particularly Silicon Valley Bank. I think they close to tripled their, their asset base. Uh, and that should appear as a higher leverage ratio, but they were buying all these assets, agency mortgage-backed securities that had a risk weighting of 20%. So it didn't appear in what they were reporting uh, as much. And maybe, you know, agency mortgage-backed securities, maybe they should have a higher risk weighting. You know, I, there's a bank analyst and investor I respect a lot who has a quote, something to the effect of, show me the risk weighting, show me the low risk weighting, and I'll show you where the asset problems are. Because, you know, in Basel II, I think, you know, banks could have AAA subprime mortgage-backed securities at a low risk weighting. Now you can have agency mortgage-backed securities at a low risk weighting, and the credit risk is you know infinitesimally small, but the the interest rate risk is huge. Well, I, I think that's a, that's a, that would actually the question I would raise is actually that bank regulators probably pro focused far too much on the credit quality and yes. not enough on the interest rate risk. So I, interest rate yeah. risk should have a higher weighting when it comes to measuring banks' um, position as a whole. As I couldn't agree more. Rate, if you're going to rate a bank, the talking heads on all the channels were saying banks are doing great. Great banks do well when it, interest rates go up, and it's like yes, but not when they interest rates go up 500 basis points in a year, and they make all the loans when when interest rates are are super low. Yeah. Uh, but Patrick, so if interest, if you know, the Fed has stopped hiking, which you know, pretty likely that they have, the problems going forward can't be interest rate risk, right? Because so they have to be uh, credit credit risk. So if if the credit risk gets serious, the the problems continue. But you know this whole problem of oh the, the Fed's you know the Fed's not going to hike from five hundred basis points to a thousand basis points, right? So yeah, yeah. So who's got the credit risk? Well, it's not really the banks, and the banks have a certain amount of credit risk. But overall, it's not the banks that have the credit credit risk. The people who have the credit risk really are private equity private credit and investors because investors for so long have gone, Oh, let's have alternative assets. So ultimately it, it, it negatively impacts um, everybody because if they've, if they've got a pension, um, it may impact, you know, we saw what happened with uh, the guilt market. Um, well, hey, that was a brief hiatus of, you just look back at it and it's like Liz of 44 days. Um, and, um, you know, the simple chaos that was quickly resolved. But it, it was also, you know, one of the things that exacerbated was the excessive amount of le le leverage that liability managers had in the system. Because rates stayed so low and volatility has been so low. They thought, oh, we can double up. So we'll, we'll sort of double the size of position and be leveraged to get that extra return until it didn't work. And, th and the real problem is it's, so this could end up being more like a 2000, 2001 recession where it effectively becomes a balance sheet recession. So households as a whole, their levels of debt are not high. It's relative, compared to where they were in 2007, they're much lower relative to income. The, the real problem is actually businesses. So we look at, um, you know, wasn't it the federal government who massively expanded its debt during COVID, et cetera. It's the US business sector. We can see that data when we get the quarterly flow of funds data. So we now have a business sector in the US or corporate debt is roughly, business debt is something like 75% of GDP. It's pretty much all time record highs because the whole model was, Oh, debt is cheap. Let's go and do buybacks. Let's we'll pay ourselves and all this sort of stuff. Well, 
debt isn't cheap now. So, and you think that the duration of those borrowings was short enough for it to be a near-term problem? Because you know, didn't you know, Amazon issued forty-year bonds. It's it's the problem of the people who lent the money because you know, interest rates are not at zero anymore. Right? It's not. Well, you know, I think we have. You know, when we talk about you know, whatever you want to call them, the fangs, they they are utilities. They have loads of cash. So that's another. That also leads to another problem when you hear Powell and Co say, "Oh, there's lots of cash in U.S. corporates." Well, actually, if you take out the top twenty people, like Apple, like Oracle, like Microsoft, actually, that that level of cash is is much much lower. Right. And then, and so, it's a misleading. It's a misleading um, approach. Um, so, corporate America is leveraged as a whole. It's leveraged like it never has been before. But when what happens when we enter times of lower growth is we generally see deleverage. So debt goes back. So we get income, actually we'll pay down the debt. We're not going to do buybacks. So I, I mean, I don't profess to be, I'm a rates man by heart, yeah. by DNA. But overall, it, it just says, says that, well, the buyback buybacks for many are going to cease to be a function function if credit spreads get wider and we need more liquidity we're going to conserve our capital but it also means investment gets curtailed and you can enable certain sectors with the inflation reduction act and all the subsidies might do okay but is that going to be enough to offset everything else got it and so i don't believe it will be Hey there, sorry to interrupt. A lot of Forward Guidance listeners are not into crypto. If that's you, please skip ahead, get back to the interview. Some Forward Guidance listeners are into crypto, some own crypto, a smaller percentage owning lots of crypto, and a much smaller percentage work at crypto hedge funds. If you're in those latter two categories, BlockWorks Research might be a good fit for you. BlockWorks Research is a research and data platform that analyzes governance, tokenomics, and models of interesting crypto projects, including new protocols. There's a lot of edge that can be gained from reading these reports. You can check out a sample report at www.blockworksresearch.com research and hit the free report toggle. If that is of interest, full subscriptions can be purchased at www.blockworksresearch.com slash sign dash up. You can also get 10% off using the discount code guidance 10. Thanks. And let's get back to the interview. Right. So Patrick, okay. you said you're a rates man. Where at the end of this cycle, where are rates headed? The terminal rate when the, the Federal Reserve, you know, it probably will cut. I don't think it will cut in the next you know, three, six months. It could. The market thinks it could. But where will the bottom in rates be? You know, in 2008, the bottom was zero. In 2020, the bottom was zero. What's the bottom this time? And how soon do you think the Fed gets there? Well, how quickly they will ease. Yeah, it might take a little bit of time, but when they do start to ease, let's not forget, we went up in chunks of 75. It wouldn't surprise me to see, a, you know, in one in them sometime just go, well, hey, we've done all this. We can do 100 basis points cut just in one fell swoop. None of this, oh, 25 a quarter nonsense, because if you go up a lot, you can come down a lot. Where do I see rates eventually settling around? Probably sub two. As inflation eventually edges back down, you know, it comes down to our star and what credit spreads like and how, thick, how, you know, I think there's a general, maybe even down to one. I mean, we thought about where do we get to um, back in 2002? We got to one. Okay, 9 11 pushed it down, but sort of one and a half to two range. I can quite happily see, I can, I can see that without any difficulty. Got it, Patrick. So you're a rates man. I want to ask you a question. You know, there, are, there are where the level of rates are now, the forward rates, but there's also the options pricing and you can you know, do a lot of complex structures on that. What do you think the odds are of further Fed hikes? And would it be a profitable strategy to sort of sell tail risk uh, of further, you know, sell, sell the risk that the Fed doesn't get to 6%? Well, you know, this probably, the I'm, I'm worst quite... trade of 2022 would be selling tail risk that the Fed hikes higher. But now it seems like at the end of the cycle, you know, the bond market is often wrong, but it's, you know, right now at this time, late in the cycle, it's probably not wrong. What do you think about that? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm not. An, I mean, don't never ask me to price an option. I'm I'm much more of a luddite. I mean, I'm quite simple. So I've been. You're not a luddite. You know, I've, so more I'm recently, I've switched to being a sort of when I talk about trading rates and stuff like that. I've been using the five year note more as my benchmark rather than tens or bonds. But I do look at various global markets, and I sort of say, well, hey, I can get a twenty year treasury, which the other day was back up at above four percent. I'll take that. I'm and actually, but you know, I don't trade these days, but I do manage my own sort of what well, we call it SIP over here, but 401k in your terms. Right, and you and over the past, buy some of the largest macro hedge funds in the world who we won't name, but who are, I, I can assure the audience, are the, the pristine blue chip hedge funds in the world. Yeah. So, but I've been buying for my own person pension, you know, 20, 30 year gilts, which were still about 4%. Uh, I was, you know, U.S. Treasuries a while back when we rates were higher pre the banks, and I'm still quite comfortable with that. Um, from a tech training perspective, um, even though the Fed's just hiked to five, and we've got a five-year note down at, it's been as low as three thirty today, or sub three thirty again. Um, the pain for me, from a short-term trading perspective, would be for a market to have like a flash crash. Another bank goes bust, something like that. There's a liquidity issue, dollar spikes, what's going to happen there? And then you end up with a, a sort of a, a sort of a bit of a mini Minsky moment for one of our description. And at which point I'm quite happy to walk away. Um, we basically it's been a bit boring really for the past six weeks because we had the big spike down, rates have bit largely been in a range. So you've had your sort of juice, but further out I just look, I look at the little very simple chart of Chinese PPI against the US 10 year note going back 20 years. And it's like what I call a Jaws chart. So you end up with like, it's like that. So I'm trying to get it on the screen. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know what I mean? It's just, it is Jaws. It's like that. Rates up here, Chinese PPI down there. Which one's going to catch up? Well, maybe a bit of compression between the two. But it just says to me that. You know, I was chatting to a friend of mine today on, on Bloomberg and I was saying, you know, sub three, I wouldn't be surprised to see rates in the short term break 3%, at which point I'll be out, you know, I'll be down the pub. <laughs> I'll be like, thank you. <laughs> All right, so at what point do you think those jaws snap shut and take, you know, many investors and the global economy with it? And let's specifically go into China where, you know, you follow China very closely in terms of the, uh, Chinese reopening, which was legit, and you know the P- P- the uh, you know Chinese citizens are spending more money. The P- the you know, PMIs are, were going up for a time, but it sounds like you are very doubtful of the Chinese recovery at all. Let alone will it you know be a ballast for the global economy? T- tell us why. Well, I was a bit skeptic about you know the euphoria that. Um, was going around late last year about China and the speed that it was going to recover and oh it was going to be a boost to global inflation well oh uh, yeah well that's worked out really well hasn't it overall I suppose I'm more balanced now because market was overexcited China's disappointed I think China will probably continue to chug along but even on today's credit data you know the property market woes it's, this is a permanent millstone. It's not going to go away. And down the line, construction, residential real estate construction, is going to be much, much lower going forward. You've got problems about external demand. As I said, exports have been softening. Good demand has been softening. And China is primarily a provider of goods. So we've got record inventories in the US. And you just have to look at freight rates across the Pacific, the collapse in container arrivals, not just on the West Coast, but also now in, over in New York and New York. And Ports of New Jersey and other ports. So, and one of the things, I mean, I, you know, I worked in Asia, I worked for Big Bank. One of the things that the street as a whole is appalling about is China. Gen- generally, there's a Pravda approach to research. You, never, you were never allowed to say anything bad. A Pravda, like Russian government propaganda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. censorship. Don't say anything bad about China. Or what, you, you know, get fired, you don't get promoted? You won't get a good enough bonus. Yeah, you could get fired if you, if you did, you know, said the wrong thing. So the people um, who get the big bonus are the people who say 
China, the sky's the limit, 15% GDP growth. So, by, by, so by, another by. A previous call uh, was like in July of 2021. I was writing about, I started writing about Evergrande because I knew a lot more about it. I follow China. You know, I know quite a few people over there. And the buyer of, of First Republic, when the Ever, Ever, Evergrande bonds were at 80 cents on the dollar, was saying buy Evergrande. And yeah, right, okay. So the bonds are now pennies. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, they get into China. And of course, last year, you get to the point where Chinese equities dump. And then they go, China is, Chinese equities are uninvestable. And then the next day, they're up 20%. So, I mean, what, but there's a general problem about China, and, and it goes all the way back to really about 2013, 2014. And I came up with this phrase, I call it the Stalinization of Chairman Xi. So, as power has been increasingly concentrated, um, whereas also these used to be these various different rivalries, all people around doing lots of stuff. Um, as power has been concentrated in the GG, there, uh, there's been a creeping paralysis. You know, I'll just tell him what he wants to hear. So therefore, it, it causes an activity. But we've also seen, for no demographic reason, but since 2016, or when he G starts to get his coming up to his get his second term, we saw the birth and marriage rate start to fall off a cliff long before COVID. It's like a real dent to people's confidence and it's still going on. So we're seeing, you know, household loans actually fell in April. Um, savings deposits keep, continue to rise. There is demand for things. So we have a, a nice active new year, but actually people were doing low, a lot of it was low budget spending as well. So they're not, they're not buying as much expensive stuff. They're also not traveling abroad. And even if you look at Macau, so everyone goes, oh, look at Macau, it's reopening. Well, Macau rev revenues are still only roughly two thirds of what they were in 2019. So it's stabilizing, it's getting slightly better, but it's hard to say, oh, this is a dynamic Chinese recovery. I'm right, P Patrick, uh, isn't it, I've seen a few charts, so you correct me if I'm wrong, that Chinese savings of consumers, you know, Chinese nationals, not, not businesses, not governments, but savings, how much money is in the bank account are very high in the same yeah. way that in April, 2020, May, 2020 in the US, the economy was, was in the tank and spending was very low, but savings was super, super high. And that was a fuel. Different beasts, two different beasts. I mean, as you know, I mean, you know, Michael, you know, so I'll give you a new plug because if any, everybody should go and listen to your recent, podcast with Michael Pettis, who knows far more about China than me, but this defensive mechanism, if you don't have a support network, and actually, the COVID experience has made Chinese citizens even more skeptical about the ability of the state to look after them. So therefore, they're saving even more, because they simply don't trust the state. And that is a, it's a, I think that's a really important thing. So you're seeing banks cutting their deposit rates. So if you look at Chinese bond yields, they've collect, they've, they've, they're down. They've, they've fallen very sharply over the past three or four months. And they're okay, the way they were in November. But overall, interest rates in China are going low. So the second largest economy in the world is easing monetary policy. And the second largest economy in the world, in fact, when we look at it, the Chinese PPI, how it leads US PPI or global PPI, China is generally leads the world. So if you think about what's going on in China, it's probably not a bad idea for Thames when it comes to market pricing and inflation for the rest of the world in sort of nine to 12 months time. Right. But isn't it accurate to say China is emerging from a recession and Europe and America are entering into a recession? So the timing is a well, little China's, bit. Well, I don't think China really had a recession. It's more like China will just bumble along, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be a massive contributor to global demand. Got it. Which is what everyone was hoping. Got it. Well, Patrick, so if, uh, to close this interview, could you sum up your views on global growth, uh, where bond yields are headed and where, where stocks are headed? I'm, I say I'm not an equity man. So I, I'm, I'm very defensive in any equity investments I have. I'm buying solid companies with good balance sheets and sort of utility type businesses or even some banks, not, not, US, not necessarily in the US, but some of the US banks. I think some of them are relatively cheap, not the USBs of this world. 
Um, I think bond yields are going lower. How quickly, how soon? But as I said, I'll take 4% on a long dated treasury or, or guilt. And uh, I think the, the um, dollar liquidity is going to get much worse. We, we, you know, maybe it'll be August when we get one of those classic spirals. But then, um, uh, you know, I think we see a stronger dollar, which in turn weighs on risk assets. And then we, everything, you know, so it could be, I think sell, the old sell in May and go away and come back on St. Ledger's Day, i.e. September, is probably not going to be a bad analogy this year. There we go. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for joining us. As people can see on Twitter, you are at PPG Macro, uh, you know, chronically underfollowed account, as is the case for you know many legitimate people in finance who spend you know a lot more time Thanks, thinking about markets and and uh, you know working with the best investors of the world rather than sort of tweeting all the time, which is which is what I do. If people want to get in touch and learn more about your work, where can they they find you, Patrick? Well, probably the best place to start is on Twitter. DM me or something like that, and then we can rather than plugging up my e email box and then we can progress from there. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. When we put the screenshot up from your email in October, I, I blocked out your email address to, you know, keep it. Thank you. Keep it That's there great. Go. Thanks All a right. lot, Jack. Patrick, thanks so much. Thanks Talk to you. Thanks. Cheers. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at Blockworks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined. Also, you can get 10% off to Permissionless 2023 and Blockworks Research using code GUIDANCE10. Thanks again and be well.